For the common people of Virginia, the coming of the war brought dramatic changes to their daily lives. Changes that brought with them memories of hardship that they would carry with them for the rest of their days. The overwhelming number of people, men and women, black and white, young and old, lived on farms, some of them no larger than enough to feed a single family, while others occupied larger plantations that supported virtual communities. Regardless of whether they slept in rough country cabins or grand mansions, almost everyone's days were filled with the work of clearing, tilling, planting, and harvesting, not to mention tending livestock, cutting and storing the hay, threshing the grain, and more. The longer the war lasted, the harder the work became, especially when the government needed some of what every farm produced to send to the armies. In the Civil War era, farm life was a hard life. It was the kind of life in which you worked all day. Uh, regardless of, of gender or age, uh, labor needed to be accomplished on the farm. So then you can imagine, once the war breaks out and the, the dynamics, the labor dynamics change at home, uh, then this is going to put an awful lot of burden uh, on those that are left uh, behind. The shortages become a real problem at the midpoint of the war. We're talking about uh, what the common phrase was, the necessaries of life. Uh, things to make bread, corn and wheat, were very difficult uh, to come by because always there was the competing need for the military. It did not help that the hard-won fruits of the soil that farmers harvested and the livestock they fed and nurtured made enticing targets for unwelcome intruders. Union cavalry raiders knew that for every beef they captured and every barn they burned, Confederate soldiers would go hungry and civilian morale would be impaired. And perhaps that would bring victory that much closer to their grasp. The Union does decide about midway through the war uh, to adopt a hard war policy. And that means that now it's time to go against the civilians. Union raiding uh, was something that certainly crossed the minds of Virginians throughout the war. They were the hardest hit, you could argue, uh, with regards to raiding. Feeding everyone in the Old Dominion became an even greater problem when so many people fled their homes to avoid advancing Union armies. People held understandable fears that the Northerners would be hard and brutal conquerors, and so many simply abandoned their homes when the Federals approached. That meant that not only could they no longer support themselves from their own farms, but now they also placed an extra strain on the areas they fled to, increasing the hardship for everyone. For the first time in their history, Virginians would find themselves competing with each other just to subsist. When Richmond became the Confederate capital, it numbered 38,000 residents. Only two years into the Civil War, the population swelled 10 times to over 300,000 people, and no accommodations were made for any of them. Prices soared upward, and the necessities of life, such as food and clothing, became scarcer. At least the adults had some knowledge of why these trials had come their way. But enduring the hunger and shortages along with them were others whose youth and innocence had not yet equipped them to understand why life for them was not as normal. All they knew was that childhood seemed somehow to be different, more restrained, less joyful. The most destructive hand of war may fall upon the children. Suddenly, Virginia youngsters in the 1860s had to endure unimagined hardships. Fathers and brothers were gone, many not to come back home. Sickness was rampant. Lack of food and clothing and medicine took a horrible toll. There was really little to laugh about and less to enjoy. Indeed, war for children produces an emptiness, a loneliness that no child deserves. Changes in children's lives extended well beyond the home. Education in wartime posed a serious challenge. Before the war, teachers were universally only men. 
But now, with the school teachers enlisted in the armies, there was no one to hold school. Many children under college age simply had to depend on what they could be taught at home after the day's chores. When the war began, Virginia had the greatest commitment to higher education of any state in the Confederacy. There were major state schools like the University of Virginia, the Medical College of Virginia, and the Virginia Military Institute. But there were a dozen or more private schools as well, like Hampton Sydney, Washington College, and women's schools like the Augusta Female Academy, not to mention William and Mary, which was the second oldest institution of higher learning in America. But the war placed great strains on higher education from the very beginning. Whole student bodies and faculties simply evaporated as the men rushed off to join the armies. Washington College sent scores of young men in the Liberty Hall Volunteers as a whole company into Jackson's Stonewall Brigade. Soon, doors began to close at school after school as there simply weren't enough faculty nor enough students. Even when they lowered their standards to admit 16-year-olds and 15-year-olds, there still weren't enough students. And then the ravages of war set in. Virginia Military Institute's buildings were destroyed in June of 1864. Emory and Henry College was shut down and turned into a Union military hospital. By the end of the war, the University of Virginia was the only major school in the entire Confederacy that had kept its doors open throughout the war, as did the Virginia Military Institute. And when the war was over, the rebuilding had to begin. And ironically, yet symbolically, much of the assistance to rebuild Virginia's higher education came from the United States government. One of the things so different for many children was that their men were gone. The hungry armies increasingly claimed almost every able-bodied male from 16 and even younger to 55 and even older. Children accustomed to the company of fathers and brothers at the supper table now saw only their empty chairs. For now, with the men away, age-old patterns of female life and responsibilities were destined to change dramatically. Once the war started and the husbands were called away, the brothers were called away, even fathers were also called away, this changes the entire dynamic on both family farms and also on plantations. And so this then uh, creates a great deal of responsibility and authority uh, for women to assert in a culture uh, in which that wasn't always readily at hand. Thousands of women and their children fled from the advancing Yankee armies. Most came to Richmond where they hoped to find a place to live and some kind of employment. A great many found employment here in the factories. In fact, 60% of the workers in Richmond's factories were women, and a fourth of those workers were children between the ages of 10 and 15, often working for no more than 17 or 20 cents a day. More women went into the Confederate Army hospitals, where they weren't so much nurses administering medication as we think of them today, but they cleaned the hospitals, they cleaned the soldiers, they helped to feed them, they provided recreation and entertainment for the wounded, and the result was that the Confederate Congress discovered that with women in the hospitals, and especially with women administrators in the hospitals, the death rate was cut in half. As the war ground on, the refugees stacked up everywhere, especially in towns and cities, whose population sometimes tripled or more. Many lived in their farm wagons parked on the streets, while some others simply camped out on the streets themselves. Suddenly, there arose new problems never before known in Virginia, problems no one knew how to handle. Most of Richmond's neighborhoods were filled to capacity during the war years. At the same time, some 200,000 refugees were roaming the countryside. Most of them had no idea where they were going, how long they would be gone. One well-known family moved no less than 34 times in the course of the war. The Civil War became part of everybody's existence. For most Virginians, daily life seesawed between anxiety and despair. The home front wasn't seeing the need for surgery that physicians were, were compelled to apply uh, in the field, in the battlefield. The, all the same medications that were available in the field, to, in the battlefield, were available at the home front as well. The home front didn't see a lot of these camp-related, congestion-related, overcrowding-related disorders 
but they still had smallpox. Um, they still had um, tuberculosis. They still had a number of different contagious diseases that could become epidemic in, in some senses. Not as often, but certainly could. I think there was a great demand for the need for, for medical care and those physicians felt a, a draw to the war or in fact were contracted away and in fact fought in the battlefield and weren't available in the home front. As with so many other things during the war, law and order presented a tremendous challenge for Virginians. Criminals never changed their way, crime continued, but now with so many of the best men away at the front, it was often difficult to find men to hunt down the criminals. And if they'd been arrested, it was difficult still to impanel a jury to try them. And if they were brought to trial, sometimes they couldn't be kept in a jail because the jail's bars had been melted down to make cannon. There were some counties in the state, in fact, in which courts simply shut down and never set for months at a time. Confederate Virginians didn't just face an enemy in their front with the Yankees. There were thousands of men in the Confederate Army who didn't want to be there. Some had been Unionists before the war and were Unionists still. There were others who simply didn't believe enough in the Confederacy to want to fight for it. And some, of course, had been drafted and forced into the Army. During the course of the war, thousands would desert and run away to remote fastnesses like this in the hills and the mountains where they could hide out for the balance of the war and wait for it to be over. And here they would be joined, not just by other deserters, but by draft dodgers, by unionists, by renegades and outlaws alike, creating virtual communities, living outside the law, and creating a second enemy within for Virginians. Virginians did not just have to worry about not breaking their own laws. Tens of thousands of them lived under military occupation behind Union lines in Northern Virginia, on the James and the York Rivers Peninsula, and in the Northern Shenandoah Valley. There, even the most law-abiding citizens had to learn new regulations as they and their occupiers tried to come to some basis for a peaceful, if not friendly, coexistence. Of course, it was going to be inevitable with Union armies marching around Virginia, that there would be clashes with the civilians. There was always a problem when Union occupiers had to deal with a local civilian population. And another problem was the dislocation of civilians in general as Union armies passed through. Tens of thousands of civilians became refugees fleeing from the armies. They flocked to Richmond and elsewhere, anywhere they thought that the Union armies wouldn't come. One of those refugees was Wilmer McLean, who in 1861 was living not far from the banks of Bull Run. And in July 1861, when the contending armies came and fought their first major battle right in his front yard, he decided to move elsewhere where the armies wouldn't find him. And so he came here to Appomattox Courthouse. Untold numbers of lonely Southern women would have said amen to a confession Abraham Lincoln once made I have often been driven to my knees by the realization that I had nowhere else to go. Faith was the biggest builder of morale in Civil War armies, so it was likewise among the home folk. In family circles, wives, sweethearts, mothers, and young ones felt a spiritual closeness to loved ones far away. And in the old hymns they sang, the words suddenly had a new meaning. For example, O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. <laughs> 